Good afternoon. Um, so now we're gonna move on to the discussion on this very interesting topic, which I will not make an introduction to compete with Mr. Hobbs in such a thought-provoking um, uh, presentation. And I will um, move straight to our distinguished pane panelists. I will start with the Judge Sane Petersone from the Supreme Court of Latvia. She will present uh, a case um, that was recently uh, decided by the Supreme Court of Latvia. So, Judge Petersone, you have the floor. Um, as the discussion will be in English, I will also speak in English for uh, presenting this case. The idea is that uh, each of us presents a case, uh, apart from Geoffrey, who already presented many cases, and then we can have some, some discussion about them. Um, I think the most interesting case, what we had in Latvia regarding bad faith, was this um, Lazit Stjapanic case. I think everyone from Latvia recognizes this trademark, right? Right. Uh, because it's a very well-known trademark and there was a very long use of it even before registration. But the circumstances were quite interesting and I think this is something that not so many countries face. And uh, this is something that is from um, the circumstances were influenced by the Soviet occupation times. So mm -hmm. I think Lithuanian and Estonian colleagues could also relate. Probably they also have some trademark issues uh, which, are, uh, which are deriving from, from um, the Soviet occupation times and what to do when there's a transfer from a uh, state-ruled uh, economy, state-controlled economy that was in Soviet times, and then after we regained our independence and we transferred to market economy. So what to do about the trademarks, right? Um, so um, the situation, uh, this, this issue this, uh, was between the Latvian company, Lima, uh, which is uh, the most well-known producer of uh, sweets and chocolates uh, in Latvia, and the Russian company, Krasny Oktyabr. And during Soviet times, uh, the Latvian company was using this trademark, or let's say producing sweets with, this, um, with some elements, with some differences in, in some products, but more or less, this is not the only registered trademark, there are some variations, but this is the main one uh, with this one. And the uh, Russian company was also using more or less the same with some variations, a bit different color, a bit more darker blue, and, but, but more or less the same painting. And the painting is actually um, by Ivan Shishkin, uh, The Morning in the Pine Forest, which is in State Tratico Gallery in St. Petersburg. But uh, these sweets were uh, pr produced really for a long time. What court established that the Latvian company was using it since 1945, so for a very, very long time. But Russian company was using it in Russian territory, Rus uh, like Republic of Russia territory, and, and, and uh, the Latvian company was using it in Soviet times, uh, producing this produce with, with this picture in, uh, in Latvian territory. So after the collapse of European Union and when we got rid of the occupation, our company was going on with producing these sweets. <laughs> but everyone, but, but Russian company said, no, actually we want to register um, our trademark in also in your Latvian territory. Uh, I will say already uh, the result and then I'll explain how the court came to that, is that actually the Latvian courts in all three instances agreed that, uh, no way, <laughs> that the Latvian company has the right <laughs> to use this trademark here in Latvia. And um, the claim was regarding uh, the bad faith uh, to both sides, because both had registered something in Latvia, more or less this photo with some variations. And um, each of the parties wanted the, um, the re registration uh, invalidated by the, by the other party. Uh, so what, um, what the Latvian court said in essence is that the main issue whether the registration in bad faith was by the Latvian company and uh, because that was a counterclaim by the Russian company and what the court said, yes, because it, the Russian company was, was uh, basing its uh, main argument uh, also on the factor that is one of the factors when you are evaluating bad faith is um, whether 
um, uh, whether the applicant knew at the, at the time of registration that a third party, someone else, is using a similar or identical trademark. And they said, yeah, but you knew that we had a registration in Russia for that, or we had in some other countries a registration for the same trademark. So you shouldn't have registered this in Latvia. This was a, the argument by the uh, Russian company. And the court disagreed, uh, referring also to uh, several judgments made by CJEU and also by the general court. And the main ones, of course, being Shockland and Fabric Lind and Sprungli and Malaysia Dairy. Probably all of you knew, all of you know those cases regarding the, the landmark decisions, judgments for uh, bad faith. Uh, and we said, okay, yes, but uh, what the CJEU also said that yes, it's, it's one of the factors, however, it is not sufficient in itself for bad faith. So also you have to look at different factors. And such factors could be the applicant's intention um, to prevent the third party from continuing to use the sign, the degree of legal protection enjoyed by the third party sign and the other sign, extent of the reputation enjoyed by a sign at the time when the application is filed, and also the origin of the sign and its use since its creation. So historical circumstances actually uh, were very important in this particular case. And uh, this is also what the, the court uh, said, that there was a lengthy and unimpeded use in good faith in the territory of Latvia by the Latvian company at least since 1945. It had become a well-known trademark uh, unregistered trademark, trademark even before registration and after registration. Also, the court said, no, there's no bad faith. Latvian company didn't register in bad faith because it was using it for, for a very lengthy period of time and consumers uh, were associating this trademark definitely with the Latvian company in Latvian territory. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Petersone. So now um, I would like to give the floor to the, our next panelist, uh, Judge Agnieszka Goladuetka, sorry if I mispronounced the last name, um, from the Court of Appeal in Warsaw. She will also present a case from the District Court of Warsaw. Um, or maybe move as well. everyone and it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for, uh, for the organizers for invitation. And I'd like to present a, a case that is, I think, quite typical and uh, it will be about the intention. What factors were there for the court, um, uh, for the court determining that it was a bad intention between the, before, uh, between, uh, uh, between the, uh, when, at the moment of the application. So uh, it was the case of the regional court of Warsaw, and actually it was already mentioned today in the first presentation, um, but we will talk about it at the end. So firstly, let's look at the facts of the case. Um, yeah, uh, multi-select, what is this? Uh, it's a part of the recruitment process in the police, and uh, it is a test to examine that psychological predisposition to work in the police, like motivation, like resistance to stress, like ability to cooperation, and it's been applied as an obligatory part of the recruitment proceedings in the police since 2005, and it is considered by the candidates to be quite difficult to pass and to be quite unpredictable. And that's why uh, there is a market for the preparatory materials. I mean, uh, the materials that will help the candidates, the police, to prepare themselves uh, to pass this part of the test. And these preparatory materials are quite popular among, among the candidates uh, to the police. And since uh, 2009 and 2018, there were different preparatory materials offer, offered in the market, like books with explanations how this multi-select works, uh, short films available on youtube.com and films and examples on different websites and forums dedicated for the candidates of the police. And um, the defendant, and the defendant was a former police officer, he retired a couple of years ago, uh, offered a book 
devoted to preparation for this, this task, multi-select, with some questions from the previous years. Actually, during his service in the police, he was involved in the recruitment proceedings. So uh, he, he simply presented his knowledge. His book was offered in traditional form, in the form of ebook, and the title was probably something like multi-select test, or simply multi-select, or how to prepare to multi-select test. And it's been offered in the market since 2009. It's been actively promoted by the defendant on the websites, forums, uh, dedicated by the candidate, uh, to the candidates, to the police. Um, and the phrase multi-select was, was used in the promotional uh, activities, but also in the title. Um, and what's going on, why, why I refer to the period uh, 2009 and 2018, what happened in, 2000, in 2018. The 5th of June 2018, the plaintiff, the subsequent plaintiff, because ha actually he has not been a plaintiff at that time, has registered at the EU trademark, multi-select. It was a word trademark. And it was registered uh, for many, many classes of goods or services. Um, among them, professional advisory services, computer programs, and online books. And during the registration proceedings, there were serious doubts uh, raised by EU IPO. Uh, and the EU IPO asked the applicant to provide some additional information, um, inter alia whether the registration will not hinder the competition and will not eliminate any entrepreneurs from the market. And the statement was made uh, by the applicant that the registration of the trademark will not affect the freedom of competition, will not deprive others from providing information on their goods and services. And the registration has been done by EUIPO. And uh, immediately after the registration, um, the owner of the trademark uh, addressed payment demands for all other parties who have been using the phrase multi-select for all the entrepreneurs who offered the preparatory materials since probably 2007, 2009, and he demanded several thousand euro for each month of the use of the trademark multi-select, uh, but it was not all. He, on his website, he presented, he presented other parties, goods and services as forgeries, something that is not original, something that is illegal. He simply presented the, the certificate of registration saying, well, I have the certificate registration and all the other preparatory materials signed by multi-select word are forgeries and shouldn't be, and, and they are offered illegally. Uh, he offered a computer program as a preparatory material and he didn't offer the e-books. Uh, here you, you j just, to remind you the legal provision, the same in the current regulation as in the previous regulation, so a new trademark shall be declared invalid on application of the office or on the basis of the counterclaim in the infringement <coughs> proceeding where the applicant was acting in bad faith when he filled the application of the trademark. Uh, and actually uh, there was a uh, counterclaim proceedings um, and um, because it's not a new regulation, it's in the current uh, regulation and in the previous one, there are some, some important court, court of justice cases mentioned already by the previous speakers. Uh, and what the court of justice said, what is important, uh, the identity or close similarity between newly registered trademark and the marks previously used and previously present in the market and the identity or similarity of the goods and services. Uh, and what is important, it has been already mentioned today, if the owner of the trademark knows or ought to know when the application for registration has been filled, that the part, third party uses the identical or confusingly similar trademark in at least one member state, um, considering uh, the time of the previously used mark and the sector of goods and services. Um, this intention, the, what the intention cannot be protected. What well, the intention is to deprive, to deprive third parties from use of the mark, to hinder the competition this way, to remove the competitor from the market, uh, especially, but not only, 
when the owner does not offer the goods or services himself or herself. Uh, it was mentioned uh, mostly in, in this case, uh, in the case Chocolate and Fabric and Link. It's, it's quite long, uh, quite old, but uh, it still, still is considered as a, a cornerstone, a cornerstone um, in, the, in the field of the bad faith. Uh, so uh, how the court, the district court in Warsaw, ap applied all the factors? He compared the similarity of marks, and they were identical. Multi-select, it was registered, and multi-select, it was previously used for several, several years uh, by the competitors in the market with no registration. He compared the similarity of services, uh, computer program for the candidates to the police, versus advisory book addressed to the candidates, so the same target group, candidates to the police, and the same group of the materials, preparatory materials. And what the owner of the trademark uh, knows, knew, or ought to know. Uh, so um, there were many years of trademark presence on the market, of the mark presence on the market before the, the application for registration has been done. Uh, it was very popular in the forums dedicated to the candidates of the police. It was promoted uh, actively in the internet. And what was important, it was earlier cooperation between the trademark owner and one of the entrepreneurs who uh, have been using the mark multi-select previously for several years. Uh, and uh, what the court, fo court found that the intention uh, was bad uh, and didn't, uh, it, it should not be protected. Uh, what factors, what, what, what three factors were decisive about that? Firstly, the direct demand to prohibit the use of word multi-select immediately after registration, and it was totally contrary to the statement made in the registration proceedings, and it was um, and, and contrary made to, uh, contrary uh, to the statement made um, to EU IPO, and presented third parties' goods as infringing, you know, the original. Uh, imitation, forgery, something illegal, something that should not have been offered. And the court decided on the invalidity of the trademark on the grounds of the bad faith. It was judgment of the 7th of October 2021 uh, given in the counterclaim proceedings. Proceeding. So what actually the court decided? The court finished the main proceedings, I mean the infringement proceedings. He dismissed the case and he par partially, only partially, finished the counterclaim proceedings, uh, saying that it was bad faith and the, the trademark should be, uh, should be declared to be invalid because of the bad faith. And um, with the rest, the court uh, decided to pen the proceedings and to ask the preliminary question. And it was the preliminary qu question mentioned today in the first presentation, saying, uh, whether there should be a very strong link between the, con the scope of the counterclaim or not, uh, and, the, and the main claim or not. We now have an answer from the Court of Justice, the Court of Justice saying that there is strong relation is not needed, uh, and the counterclaim, the rest of the counter counterclaim should be, should be decided, so uh, now the, the file is back in the court uh, to, to, finish the, uh, to finish the proceedings totally. Um, so generally, the court said, when decided about the fa bad faith, that the intention was to abuse the system of EU trademark. Uh, it was uh, the use of the trademark uh, that not, does not fall within the scope of the function of the trademark. And it has been uh, previously mentioned in the previous presentation as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Judge Kolaweska. And uh, before I move on to our next distinguished panelist, I would like to briefly mention that um, hopefully uh, all of you or some of you have uh, some questions to make to the panel, to, to the panelists at some point. So that will come after uh, our last presentation. And with that being said, I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Uh, Andrzej Steck, um, the Legal Secretary of the General Court of the European Union, to uh, he'll present a few cases uh, from the General Court. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like also to thank the organizer 
uh, Judge Zane Peterson, uh, the patent office, WIPO, and all the organizers for having me invited. It's uh, a great honor for me. Um, I will not be uh, speaking today too much about uh, what the General Court is doing in trademarks because tomorrow we'll have a little bit more for an introduction. Today I'd like to present just three cases which I consider to be among uh, pivotal or important ones in the bad faith decisions. Um, maybe just to start, we really have the last two or three years a lot of bad faith cases. This is something uh, probably new that if you go five or 10 years in the past, you would be searching to, to find a good case law or jurisprudence. We still had Lind and some others, but now really maybe the economy has changed. All the parties understood that the bad faith is a new possibility to fight. And therefore we, we have even now on the table a lot of cases. Um, I will take profit of all the excellent presentations which already uh, had been said today. And uh, some of the cases like Hasbro, you will see I will go directly to uh, some different points than those which were already mentioned, uh, in particular by Jeffrey Hobbs. But what I'd like to say is, uh, in the first case, La Irlandesa, something about the deceptiveness and the bad faith. It's because I would like to focus where the bad faith can go really uh, further in a situation where at first sight you had an absolute ground of refusal which was used by the EYPO in that case, but then uh, the General Court uh, took uh, another solution or accepted the other part of the solution. On the second case I'll be presenting, the Nehera case, um, it is a case which follows an older case Simca to depart itself from the solution. It is about the residual notoriety of a trademark. It's a very interesting question because you have still uh, the idea uh, which was mentioned in the last presentation concerning a uh, party knowing about the existence of an anterior mark, but uh, finally being able somehow to register his or her own mark. And the uh, Hasbro monopoly case is about refiling, so a very often recurring situation. I also start with the first page, which is, uh, as Jeffrey mentioned, probably the most important case, uh, the sky kick. We have these two possible problems. You are undermining in a manner inconsistent with honest practices, interests of third parties. We'll have at least one or two of the three examples on this part. And secondly, you have, without targeting a third party, some other problems, so you want an exclusive right for other purposes than those falling to the function of a trademark. Here on the Irlandesa case, uh, just what you might focus on is, if I may ask, you see the products. Uh, take any of them, take the meat or take, I don't know, uh, milk or butter. And you have this trademark which was registered in 2013 Important thing, before there were some contacts and some real activity by the trademark registering company and a company existing in Ireland, so some real business, which afterwards ended. So what happened? In 2014, you had uh, a request by Ireland, so the state Ireland, and also Ornia Cooperative, to render this mark invalid because it was, in their view, deceptive under 71G, and secondly, also because of the bad faith question. The important thing on the 71G, the deceptiveness, the EYPO, the Board of Appeal, considered that it was a deceptive mark as it rendered clear to the consumers that the products have something in common with Ireland. Uh, for all the reasons you see, the green color, the Emerald Island, etc., And therefore, a consumer in Spain, uh, which was pertinent in this case, would consider that the butter or the milk comes from Ireland, although there was evidence that the company in reality was selling also meat or butter, which was, for example, from Germany or from Austria. So now what happened? Um, the General Court 
considered clearly the link between the mark and Ireland existed. Every consumer would see La Irlandesa as something referring to Ireland. Nevertheless, the problem was that at the time of the registration, there was not an inconsistency between that trademark and the products as they were defined. So in fact, objectively, it was possible, as the definition was very large, to have a butter coming from Ireland or the company could have used the trademark without any deceptiveness. Therefore, the general court considered that this ground was not a ground for annulment of a trademark. On the other hand, taking into account the fact that really there were decades of cooperation before between uh, the company registering the trademark La Irlandesa and the Irish company, which then ended, and that there was a non-insignificant part of goods which were sold, which came in fact from Germany or from Austria, it was considered that this is a relevant fact for the bad faith analysis. Therefore, the situation with bad faith is a little bit different because you can take into account all the context, uh, even uh, evidence from 2014, 15, and 16, considering uh, the situation at the time of the registration. And on this ground, it was considered that the EUIPO was right in annulling uh, the trademark. Now, this is important because it opens uh, a similar question like in Sky, how far have you to define the products or services? Uh, in the file, there was a question, wouldn't there be an obligation to define the services as butter coming from Ireland to be sure that the mark is not deceptive? But then uh, the general court said, no, there's no such legislative obligation and not even in the case law, because if it were, you would have many companies with problems. I, I would mention just Slovenka in Slovakia, well, I come from Slovakia, uh, is producing textiles which come from Slovakia, but can have some small products from Czech Republic. It does not mean that the trademark will be null for, for example, deceptiveness. Uh, and finally, in this case, it was not necessary to define how much of the products would be still uh, to come from the country where the trademark focuses on. Anyhow, it was one of the cases on the bad faith. The second one is also quite interesting in my view because it's about the surviving reputation. Very shortly, in 2013, you had a case where a person registered the trademark you see, Nehera, uh, the person, in fact, was not having any link, familial or commercial, with somebody who in the 1930s, 1940s, had the same trademark registered in the ex-Czechoslovakia, mm -hmm. so in particular between uh, the two world wars. Uh, that trademark used to be uh, relatively well known in Czechoslovakia. However, uh, if it were known in 1930s, 1940s, it was not anymore in the evidence clearly stated that it still had some residual notoriety in 2013. So when the person registered once more that trademark. Um, the AIPO considered that this a uh, situation of the bad faith, uh, the general court considered otherwise for the simple reason that in absence of a surviving reputation, the person was in fact not really taking into profit an anterior mark. It's a very limited case for the reason that in 2013, when the application for the new trademark Nehera was done, uh, that person explicitly said that he tried to revive an older mark, um, he was trying to get a resurrection of an older mark, but as the older mark was, let's say, unreal, it was not even registered, not anymore used or known by anybody, um, the decision was that it was not sufficient for a bad faith uh, consideration, and uh, that trademark was, annual, was not annulled, which is a different case with SIMC or some ant anterior cases. And the last case I wanted to mention, not to take too much time, is just one other part of the Hasbro case, uh, where you already uh, hear today what it was about. Uh, this is 
a very important case and is not the only one on this question. In fact, other Hasbro and Monopoly cases are currently ongoing at the, at the General Court. I focus just on this one. The thing that was at hand was whether, as we all know, you have in this five years period after registration of a trademark, a protected period where you don't have to show a real use or a genuine use of a trademark. But what happens if a company is refiling for same or similar trademarks, which this company owns for same or similar products, a new European trademark, is it something prohibited or not? Is it bad faith or not? Uh, interestingly, the legislation does not prohibit explicitly such an action. So in this case, what was probably decisive was that in the evidence, it was clearly stated that the person, when doing this refiling of a trademark, wanted to easify a little bit his or her administrative situation and maybe not having to prove with all the burden which such a proof requires, the genuine news of the firstly registered trademark. And therefore, this was considered by the General Court to be a strategy which is inconsistent with the objectives of the trademark law. So here we are in a situation exactly of not attacking a third party, but of somehow being close to an abuse of law, so formally observing the law, but in reality um, inviting the administration uh, to do something which was not really presupposed uh, by the legislator, and this was considered as bad faith. And to finish with one sentence, because the question uh, was uh, given in the presentation of Jeffrey Hobbs on the relation between this dishonesty and, for example, abuse of law, um, I do also consider that the dishonesty in the bad faith situation is very specific and does not necessarily to go uh, that far as to prove all the elements of the abuse of law or abuse of law as it is known uh, in, in French law. That would be my um, personal opinion. So uh, this was just uh, to, to mention three or four cases and uh, we might discuss some, some others. There are many, many other cases uh, at the table. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I will like the, to open the floor for questions. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to break the ice or comments or critics. Okay, in that case, um, I don't know if between the panelists uh, there is any uh, questions you would uh, like to uh, discuss, maybe in relation to uh, Mr. Geoffrey's Hobbs. Uh, what, what, there you go. Can I ask the audience to say whether they think that the law as they've heard it outlined on bad faith filing is satisfactory? Could you tell me what you think? So the question is whether the law is satisfactory as it stands, and the answer is clearly no, because there are so many questions open that uh, we still need much more individual cases, including the forthcoming judgment of the UK Supreme Court. But as I have the microphone, I might ask the panelists along the lines uh, that Mr. Hobbs uh, explained First of all, is abus de droit or abuse of rights, is that a concept of European Union law already? And where actually is it located? And secondly, is uh, bad faith just an element of, under the understanding of the panelists, an element, a subcase of abus de droit? Or is this an entirely different category? Because I don't find abus de droit as an absolute or any kind of ground of rejecting a trademark, but you do find bad faith. But maybe the panelists can explain their understanding of the relationship between abus de droit and uh, bad faith. 
I see Mr. Steck here wants to... Uh, Thank you very much for the question. If I can give just my pr proper opinion, it's uh, nothing but a, a personal uh, idea. Um, as we see also in, in the case Hasbro, uh, when the bad fate was analyzed, there was only a partial reference to Abu Dhabi. It was not said that it was exactly an Abu Dhabi that happened, that it was more something comparable, so still different. I, I don't think, in my understanding, that uh, the Abu de Droit, as it exists in, in the French law and is defined under some precise conditions, would be automatically considered as a European uh, concept. But um, the problem with bad faith uh, as a notion in, in general, and I would maybe also reply to the question of uh, Jeffrey Hobbes currently, is that uh, being relatively uh, gray in such a way that there are still a lot of gray areas in this concept. This is the reason why the parties are starting to use it uh, so often. And it's not only on uh, the European territory. I recently discussed that in Singapore uh, with uh, uh, judges uh, from China, Japan, and they have a similar situation. Um, I think that unless it will be clearly limited what can still go inside this term, we will have an explosion of cases on, on bad faith. And that is also uh, practically very problematic um, because in the part where we were on the analysis of bad faith registrations which go against a third party, you can find some unclarities on uh, subsequent elements of explication. For example, is the using of a cease and desire uh, letter, which was also in one of the cases mentioned uh, by the panelists today, is it clearly uh, first evidence which helps to show bad faith, or is it in contrary something which is a completely normal approach of a person who just registered his own trademark? Uh, as would be in cases like uh, Peterson, the, the big up, big up case, or as was in uh, the, uh, uh, the, the question La Riviera. Uh, so I think we still have to, to fix also these elements which form the indicia of, of a bad fate. That would be mm -hmm. okay. So let me answer. There was a question as to whether there is already a principle of a but de droit in EU law. The, from a whole line of cases, which includes the Halifax case, which was a tax case. There's a whole line of cases which establish that in EU law, you can't use a legislative provision for a purpose which is um, not within the scope that it was provided for. It's a misuse of a legislative provision. Now, if I remember the law correctly, the EU law on this point, there is no requirement for a mental element in doing that. In other words, there's certainly no requirement that when you commit that wrong, procedural wrong, that you were acting dishonestly. And I'm very clear in my own mind, looking at the passages that Andre put up just now from Monopoly, that what really got to them and what they really wanted to establish in the EU IPO and the General Court on Appeal was that you shouldn't be able to use the opportunity for successive filings to relieve yourself of the obligation for proof of use. Now, there's case law in member states which indicates that actually you can refile if you want to. It's your issue. You can look after your own trademark. And there are a number of member states where they would say, it's not bad faith to do that if, in fact, you could perfectly well have proven that you got use for what you have just refiled for. But put that on one side, my view of the Monopoly case is that it is a really clear example of a bout de droit within the EU doctrine. It wasn't necessary for them to classify it as bad faith, and it wasn't necessary to classify the conduct as dishonest. And there have been two Board of Appeal decisions subsequently in uh, the EU IPO which have not applied it as an automatic rule anyway. So moving from that, I would say that bad faith is not a subcategory of a bout de droit. I would simply say bad faith means bad faith. Just like Brexit means Brexit. Oh, what have I said? <laughs> Anyone, you want to comment, Judge Peterson? 
Well, probably not much to add to the exciting uh, discussion on, on this particular subject. I can only agree with, with you. And um, I, I think we shouldn't be afraid of that it still has a lot of gray area because I think it's normal and we can never really uh, make an exhaustive list, for example, or a precise definition, right? So is there we should always go by the circumstances of that particular case, more or less. Even if, yes, it is an autonomous um, autonomous concept of, of EU and it has to be interpreted in the same manner throughout the EU, but it, it's, it's, it's still, circumstances can be so different, right? Uh, well, uh, I think that, uh, yes, but faith is bad faith, but uh, I think that when we've got bad faith uh, on the basis of the EU law and uh, in the EU provisions and EU judgments, uh, we can still classify uh, these actions or omissions, this dishonesty as the abuse of law uh, on the basis of the domestic, in the domestic national uh, legal system. Uh, it, it, even it's not the matter of EU law, it still can be qualified on the basis of the domestic law. Yeah, thank you. Okay, wait. So I guess uh, we're right on time. Um, Just. Ah, sorry, please go ahead. Yes, I, I partially already got the answer, but I promised everybody some stupid questions. So one maybe from my side. Uh, regarding the argumentation between bad faith when it's basically classified as bad faith and, and when dishonesty. Uh, in, 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 in I understand that it's done in context of the, the in, if I understood correctly, in the context of EU law. But how could it be, how could you go from the concept of that being kind of in the case qual classified as dishonesty without, I mean, the co with, with Different, differentiating it from bad faith because the question is can you basically be qualified as, as a dishonest in good faith? I mean, this, these are the concepts where the gray area I understand kicks in, but I don't understand where the, how the differentiation can, can be happening. I understand your concept that bad faith is just bad faith, but that's the aim, I mean, in the sense when you evaluate, but the, 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 practical, the, the practical actions which, which are done, they, they anyways will be, will be done in bad faith. I mean, the same as abuse of, of law. Uh, it's just, isn't tho aren't those terms kind of overlapping in the sense of, of, uh, of uh, when you evaluate the situations or there is some argumentation why there is such a strong s notion to, to differenti differentiate between them? Okay, so let me try. Um, it says definitely that the invalidity is for filing in bad faith. Whatever, whatever you may ultimately decide that bad faith means, it is a requirement of the legislation. The next thing that happens is that people wish to soften it. Every uh, claim in civil law, civil law actions, civil actions for dishonesty or improper behavior, there's always a tendency to turn it into the proposition that no, no reasonable or honest person would have done this. Now you'll notice that when you turn it into the proposition no reasonable or honest person would have done this, you've turned it into a completely objective standard and you're no longer looking into the actual subjective intentions of the person who you're examining for whether they've done the right or the wrong thing. Now I, I believe that when the CJEU has repeatedly said you look at the subjective intention and you work it out from objective behavior, they meant it subjective intention for dishonesty. Now, there's another aspect to this, which is that it's too easy to say as though it's binary, it's either good faith or it's bad faith, whereas in fact there's a whole spectrum of possibilities between good faith and bad faith, 
and the obligation is not to make an application for registration in good faith. It's an obligation simply to file, fill in the form and pay the fee. So I do think that when the analysis is finished, it will come to a subjective intention that merits a finding, yes or no, was this person acting in bad faith, namely dishonestly? That's, that's what I think. Anybody? If I may, I, I would agree. I, I think uh, very often that dishonesty is mentioned uh, with the other two words, uh, dishonesty in usual commercial actions, so, so it's, it's, it's very often really taking the context of what happens usually on the market and then searching objectively how you can evaluate the subjective intention which was um, just uh, discussed. And uh, my understanding is that really the, the bad faith as a notion, which has uh, these aspects mentioned in Lint and then um, exemplified further in some other case law, um, can have as a helpful point the notion of the abus de droit, but not as a necessary point. It, it can be considered as somehow uh, divided also in those categories where you are not acting against a third person, but really somehow trying to take profit of, of the law. Yeah, well, I'm thinking about the one more difference. Actually, we are think when we are talking about the faith, but faith is always examined or determined or evaluated for the moment when the application for the registration is made. And when you t we talk about the abuse of the trademark, the abuse of the trademark can occur later. So I I when, when we are thinking about the, the time and the, the moments which are, which are important, uh, simply because of that, one reason we cannot identify bad faith and the abuse of the trademark because the abuse of the tra trademark can occur simply later, not at the moment of the registration. I, I agree with that and, and I think it's really important because you said the abuse could occur later and you're absolutely right and the proof of it is in Article 3.2 of the Enforcement Directive which you've seen up on the screen I think twice, twice this afternoon which amongst the other things says the enforcement must be fair and, and effective, but not so as to create or perpetuate an abuse. And it is, in my view, it's very possible to defend an action for infringement of a registered trademark on the basis that the assertion of the right is abusive or disproportionate or both. So yes, I really agree on, on the timing of this. You're focusing on a specific phase in time on a subjective intention, often when a mark hasn't even been used or not used to the full extent, and you're trying to work out what the objectives of that person were in circumstances where they might not even know what their own objectives were. Uh, and one more remark, uh, because of this, of this difference in the moments of time, uh, when we are thinking about the abuse of the, uh, there is always a question to abuse of what? to abuse of the trademark or to abuse to the, of the right to obtain the trademark, to register the trademark. Because actually at the moment when the application for registration is made, there is no trademark. So if, you w if we are thinking about that moment, it will be only about, uh, we, we can only discuss the, the abuse of the right to register of the trademark, not the tra trademark itself. Thank you, yes, and I, I would agree with that. And also, as, as one of the examples, the La Riviera case uh, on the airports uh, between Italy and uh, France seems to me quite interesting on this, on this moment which is decisive because you even can have a question when you have two companies which have had some cooperation in the past and one had some maybe not clearly precise but mentioned an intention to register a trademark and then in fact the other one is the one who really register that trademark and finally it was not considered uh, as a bad faith situation so, so, so really the timing at the registration, the chronology is extremely important in, in the details. Yes. Thank, you very, thank you very much. I, I, I have just ten more questions uh, <laughs> but uh, well then my colleagues would probably kill me because we probably need to finish up and uh, 
Exactly. I was going to say I'm really sorry I have to interrupt this fascinating discussion. Uh, there will be dinner, so if, if you want to continue discussing bad faith, I think uh, you can do it over dinner as well. Uh, but now I think uh, we need to continue with the program. But I want to ask you, all of you, to please give a round of applause to the panelists. Um,